Uh, get your Bibles out if you haven't already. Uh, we believe that, you know, to understand the Word of God, you got to, you know, teach it, you got to read it. Uh, so please be, uh, you know, a person that brings their Bible to church. I know a lot of you have it on your, your phone and your tablets. That's okay by me. Uh, just make sure that, you know, you put it on airplane mode or something so you're not distracted by everything else. The problem with, you know, those kinds of things on digital media is you're always getting texts and emails and it's easy to be distracted. Let's focus on the Lord together. Uh, we're in the Old Testament book of Nehemiah. We've come as far as verse 3 in Nehemiah chapter 7. So we're picking up in verse 4 this morning. Now, remember when we started this study, uh, we talked about how this was a, a historical look, you know, at the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem. You know, uh, this is Nehemiah's journal. It's his diary, you know. He wrote down his experiences as, you know, God ministered to him, called him out of that, that lowly position that he was in in the Persian Empire. He was a, a slave in the king's court, you know, the cupbearer for the king. God called Nehemiah out of that, that lowly role uh, and really, man, used him to not just, you know, fix the, the walls and gates of Jerusalem, but, you know, to, to redirect the people's hearts. You know, and then even put him in a position of power. He became governor of the land. You know, uh, when, when people say the church shouldn't talk about political things, uh, I disagree because the Bible is full of political appointments. And Nehemiah is uh, no doubt one of those appointments. Uh, now, as we approach our text today, we see that the walls are up. You know, the, the gates are back on the walls. The, the doors are on the gates. Uh, but the study isn't over, you know, uh, because it's not just a, a historical look at the work that they did. This is a spiritual look at the work that we need to do, right? Uh, we need to make sure that as people of faith, you know, when you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, you know, you literally become the dwelling place of his spirit, the, the temple, if you will, of the Holy Spirit of God. Uh, and the devil likes to attack God's temple. We see that in the book of Nehemiah. Uh, we see it through uh, world history, uh, and we certainly see it in our own lives. The devil likes to attack. He wants to breach the walls. He wants to, to distract and disrupt. And we need to make sure that, you know, we use the word of God as a gauge, you know, a, a blueprint of sorts of, you know, how to navigate this life, and that we, you know, keep building up our walls. We, we build up our defenses. You know, we set those gates and we set those doors and we don't let the devil in. And there's a reason why. We don't just want to sit inside the walls and go, oh, look at this handiwork. Look at what I've done. You know, that's not why God called Nehemiah to help the people rebuild the walls so they could just boast of their, their own works and deeds. It wasn't their work, individually or corporately. God might have called them together, you know, to put hand to trowel, but it was his work that was done. God called them to, to rebuild the walls so that they could worship him, church, with, with greater uh, fervor and freedom than they ever had before. You know, it had been uh, at least 85 years since they'd had opportunity to worship uh, as they are as we begin to press into chapter 7 and then into chapter 8. And, you know, what, one of the interesting things is right away when we you know, got into chapter 7, after the walls are up and the gates are up and the doors are on the gates, uh, they immediately began to appoint positions for the work of the temple, right? They appointed porters and they appointed singers and they appointed Levites, you know, because, well, the porters were there to protect the outer courts, uh, to make sure that the enemies of God weren't coming into the house of God. Uh, the singers were there to lead the people in worship, to prepare them for the word, uh, don't forget when we were studying through that text, we talked about how, you know, uh, there's a historical record of the singers going out before the armies of Israel. You know, it doesn't just prepare us uh, for the word, you know, worship. It prepares us for battle, church. And, and no doubt, it's, it's an important position in the temple and in God's church today. And, and then the Levites, you know, they weren't just there to expound on the word. They did do some of that, but that was really more of the priestly role. Um, the Levites were there to work on the temple, you know, to tend to the daily sacrifice. They were there to clean the inner courts, even protect the inner courts. You know, that they had an important role to play, and, and a lot of people relied on them. And so they got busy about appointing those roles. Now, Nehemiah also appointed two other positions. You know, two men were chosen to, you know, kind of help rule this newly fortified city of Jerusalem, Hanani and Hananiah. Well, Hanani is Nehemiah's brother, right? 
We first met him in, in chapter 1. He showed up in Persia and said, you know, told Nehemiah about the condition of the walls. Uh, he told him uh, about the you know, plight of the people because the walls were breached and because there was no uh, defense of the city. And so the Lord used that to you know, bring Nehemiah to a place where he then went to help you know, commence the work. But listen, that's not why he was appointed to this position. A lot of people would say, oh, Hanani was just appointed to help rule because he was Nehemiah's brother. This isn't nepotism. No, actually, in, in verse 2 of chapter 7, it says that he was a faithful man and that he feared God above many. That's why he was given a role within the, the ministry of God's church, because he feared God and he was a faithful man. Listen, do you want to serve the Lord? I, I pray that you do. Live a, a life of reverence. Be faithful. God will use you. And then finally, after all of that hard work, no doubt, uh, they did something else that was very important. It says that they set a watch. You know, what's the point of rebuilding the walls and setting the gates and setting the doors if you don't put people on the walls to sound the alarm if the enemy approaches? Because what we know for sure is foreign enemies can breach the walls. But if you have people on the walls, you know, and if they sound the alarm, you know, there's, there's armies gathering outside, you know, you blow the horn, and the people inside the walls prepare for battle. You know, if you're not ready for the fight when it comes, you're going to lose the fight. And that's why a lot of people, you know, when the devil comes after them, and, you know, let's face it, he does it all the time. You know, the devil likes to steal, kill, and destroy. Uh, and if you're not ready for that, you know, if you're not trained up in the word of God, boy, he's going to run all over you. And so we pick up chapter 7, verse 4. It says, Now the city was large and great, but the people were few therein, and the houses were not built. And my God put it on my heart to gather together the nobles and the rulers and all the people that they might be reckoned by genealogy. And so I found a register of the genealogy of those which had come up at the first. You know, this is 15 years prior with Ezra when he returned to the land. And I found the genealogy written therein. So uh, the walls are finished. The gates are up, right? We've discussed that. But I love that Nehemiah is still making himself available to be used by God. He could have very easily gone, okay, I've done what I came to do. Uh, it's time to go home. I, I told Artaxerxes that I was going to come back after I finished. And so, you know, this is the end of the job. He knew his job wasn't over. He's making, he's making himself available, not just to the people, but he's making himself available to God. We read here that the city's large, but the people are few within it. Listen, the... The actual outline of the city of Jerusalem in that day, kind of the city of David as we would view it today, uh, really not that big at all. And yet, um, you know, there's not a ton of people inside its gates. Uh, so God puts it on Nehemiah's heart to take a census. Why is he going to do that? You know, is it so he can tax the people and, you know, become rich? You know, I, uh, let's face it. Uh, what do we know about, you know, a census in Scripture? Well, when... You know, uh, Joseph and Mary made their way from Nazareth to Bethlehem. It was because the Romans called for a census. They wanted to count the people in the land that they were from, the towns that they were supposed to be a part of, so that they could tax them. But that wasn't what Nehemiah was up to here. As a matter of fact, they were looking at things through the eyes of the world. Nehemiah is looking at this through God's eyes. You know, he's going he's gonna, to you know, take a census of sorts because he wants to properly appoint people to do the work of God. And in order to do that, he's going to need to know the, the family lines of the people that are there. And so it says in verse 6, These are the children of the province that went up out of the captivity of those that had been carried away, whom Nebuchadnezzar the king of Babylon had carried away and came again to Jerusalem and to Judah, everyone to his own city. So 85 years earlier, right? Nebuchadnezzar shows up at the gates of Jerusalem. He's got this massive army. He breaches the gates. He destroys the city. He kills, you know, most of the people. He leaves with the children, like literally teenagers and below. He leaves with the children of Israel. You know, the story of Daniel, Mishael, Hananiah, Azariah, right? So 70 years of captivity. They could have avoided that 
if they would have listened to Jeremiah, right? Jeremiah was there in the city during Daniel's childhood, speaking truth, warning the people, trying to correct their course, but they refused to hear his voice, which was no doubt the voice of God. And because of that, they're carried away into captivity. You know, you know the story. Eventually, the Persians overtake, um, you know, the Babylonians, and uh, ultimately, uh, Ezra is, is loosed to go back. Uh, we actually read in the book of Daniel that he doesn't return because he feels like he's too old to make the journey. But some do. Some of the, the younger people, you know, go back with Ezra. That was 15 years before Nehemiah shows up. Now, listen. Uh, we're not going to read every name contained in the roughly 68 verses that follow here. You know, there's this, this picture of all of the people that had come back from captivity, uh, at least to this area, to the city of Jerusalem. Uh, now, we're not going to read them all, but that doesn't mean that they're not all important. The fact is, it would take a long time, and not, not every name is important to our conversation today. But they are all important names. You know, it, let's, let's say we had a... a seating chart, you know, a Sunday morning chart. Every name would be important, right? If I said, hey, this morning we're going to read the names of the people in, in the congregation of the Lord. You would sit there and you would wait to hear your name, you know, read. I, I would hope that you would greatly anticipate hearing that named among faithful brethren. No doubt every name on this list is important. But some of these names are very specific to roles that needed to be filled in the, in, the, in the house of the Lord. And so, uh, really, we're looking for the families that, you know, uh, you know, fill that void. Now, keep in mind, out of the roughly 3 million Jews that were taken away into captivity, uh, about 50,000 returned. I mean, that's a staggeringly low number of people. Now, some of them, like Daniel, didn't return because they were just too old to make the journey. But... Others didn't return because they become comfortable in a foreign land. And that's, listen, man, that's a dangerous place to be, spiritually speaking. You know, we're God's children. We're his church, right? We have to make sure that we don't become overly comfortable in the world that we're living in. I may live in this world, but I'm not of this world. Read John chapter 17, right? It's a beautiful prayer. Christ is praying to his Father for the disciples, and no doubt as you read through it for us as well. And he makes the point. He wasn't of this world, and we aren't of this world. We might live here, but we're sojourners in this land. We can't grow too comfortable in a foreign land with foreign customs and foreign policies and foreign governments. No, I'd serve a theocracy. God is on his throne. Christ at his right hand. I'll abide by the laws of the land as long as the laws of the land don't go against the law of God. That's where I draw the line. That's where the church needs to draw the line. As a matter of fact, that's where the church failed in the days of Nazi Germany. The, you know, law of man clearly went against the law of God, but the church remained silent. We can't be silent today. No, only 50,000 Actually, less than that. We'll see about 42,000 named for us in the chapter here. Returned to repatriate the land. And so I'm going to give you a, a brief overview of sorts, uh, verse 7 to 65 here. But there are some, some things that I, I think I need to touch on out of sheer importance. So jump down to verse 39. Because in verses 39 to 42, the lineage of the priesthood is given. This is the, the house of Aaron, the men of the house of Aaron. Why is that important? Because in order to have worship in the temple, you would have to have priests. And in order to have priests biblically, according to God's rule and appointment, they had to, well, they had to come from Aaron's line, right? That was the priesthood. That was God's plan. Now, by the time you get to the New Testament, when, when Jesus shows up on the scene, the priesthood is, man, uh, all over the place. There were still a few that were of Aaron's line. Um, but boy, like the, the high priests, they were appointed by Rome. You know, they weren't the Aaronic priesthood. They were the priesthood of man. And that's why things had gotten so far off course. No, God has a plan, and his plan is perfect. And it's important to us to first know the plan so that we can abide by the plan. So again, verse 39 to 42 
the priests, the children of Jedidai, of the house of Jeshua, 970 and 3. The children of Emur, 1,050 and 2. The children of Pashur, 1,240 and 7. The children of Harim, 1,017. And so there's a, a pretty decent amount of priests, or at least men of Aaron's line that have returned to the land. This is what they could draw from for the priesthood. Now, in the next verse, verse 44, or excuse me, verse 43, uh, we have the Levites. These are the men of the house of Levi, the tribe of Levi. Now, we talked about the, the role of the Levite in the temple. Man, and that was deep and wide, you know. That, that this were the people that were preparing the daily sacrifice, cleaning the inner courts, protecting the inner courts. Uh, these were the people uh, keeping up the temple, even building new parts of the temple. But I need you to notice something. It's a much smaller group, the Levites, than the priests. Verse 43, the Levites, the children of Jeshua of Kadmiel, the children of Hedova, 74. 74! Out of the couple thousand priests, there's only 74 Levites, or those of the tribe of Levi, that could be, you know, taught the, the role of the Levite in the temple. In verse 44, we have the line of Asaph. Now, you find in the, the Psalms that Asaph wrote 12 of the, of the Psalms that we read. Now, these are the singers. The singers, the children of Asaph, 140 and 8. And so there's even less singers than there are Levites. And then in verse 45, the porters. Now, the porters protected the outside of the temple. You know, they stood, you know, watch at the, at the door. We have a, a pretty awesome safety team here at Calvary. You can consider them the porters of the house of the Lord. They were protecting the inner and the outer courts. Uh, now, the chief porters had to be of the tribe of Levi as well. It says the porters, the children of Shalom, the children of Atir, the children of Talmon, the children of Akub, the children of Hatit, the children of Shobai, there was 130 and 8. So even less than the singers and Levites. And so basically, again, uh, what we find in these verses 7 to 65 is that Nehemiah is looking to identify family lines. He's looking to, you know, for the house of Aaron, for the house of Levi, for the house of Asaph, and, and certainly others, to make sure that the positions, the roles that are being filled in the temple are being filled biblically and not emotionally. You know, they're not personal appointments. They're appointed because this is the way the Bible says it's supposed to be done. And that's so important. Because sometimes, you know, it doesn't happen that way. That We find that, you know, when man appoints, he doesn't always use a biblical principle to do so. And so we have to be careful, whether that's in the house of the Lord, in a church today, or, you know, just the, the roles that we, you know, have that we operate under in our homes. The husband being the head of the house. Man, you, you often see men thrown in the towel. Well, go ahead, hon. You know, lead spiritually. I've got a project in the garage. No, there's a, there's a biblical role. And we're supposed to, to live in line with that role. Church, rise up. And so it says in verse 66, the whole congregation together was 40 and 2,303 score. Besides their... Uh, manservants and their main servants, of whom there were 7,330 and seven. They had 240 and five singing men and singing women. Their horses, 730 and six. Their mules, 240 and five. Their camels, 430 and five. And then it says 6,720 asses. So I think it's pretty cool that, you know, we're given this, this full list of names here. These are the people that are willing to be pioneers in what was a very unfamiliar land. The land of Israel, the city of Jerusalem, it was unfamiliar to them. And yet, they were willing to come and to, to play their part. You know, to, to blaze a trail. To be light in darkness. Church, that's our call to the community that we live in today. It should be an unfamiliar land. Every time I step foot outside my door, it seems more unfamiliar than the, le the day before. It's constantly changing, constantly degrading, falling apart, unraveling at the seams. But that doesn't change our role. The Lord has called us for a purpose. You know, he's raising us up for a purpose, to, to be a light, to, to 
take back the land. I also think it's cool that not just are we given the names, but the numbers are broken down for us. We're we're told that there's 42,360 citizens of the city of Jerusalem. To put that into perspective, as of uh, the 2020 census, that was the last national census, uh, in Marion, Iowa, there was 41,535 people. So just under how many citizens lived inside the walls of Jerusalem. Now, the, the land mass of Marion, Iowa, is like 40 times bigger than the land mass of the city of David, the, the area of Jerusalem that they're living in. So, you know, when you look out at your yard and you look and drive by all the cornfields and soybean and the ponds and the beautiful trees, you know, that's, that's not the makeup of the land that they were living in. If you've been to Israel, and if, if you haven't, listen, uh, you should go with us one of these times. We try to go every other year. You know, uh, hopefully we'll make it there in 2025. But the fact is, when you get to Jerusalem, man, it's rocks, you know. Everywhere you look, as far as you can see, rocks and boulders. You know, it's not like there's a lot of farmland, although uh, they had gotten good at raising crops. And, you know, as a part of that, you know, sheep and goats. And, man, you know, the Lord can help a people prosper. But he also made sure there was a water source. You know, the spring of Gihon was inside the walls of the city. And because of that, you know, they could build up the walls and still have, you know, that important life-giving water at their fingertips. So 42,360. You know, as of that 2020 census, uh, there was about 137,000 people living in Cedar Rapids. So think about how many more people in this community than there were in that one. You know, just again, some perspective. 736 horses, 245 mules, 435 camels, 6,720 donkeys. You know, uh, no doubt, uh, you know, the Lord was making sure the people were taking an account of everything that was readily available to them so they could uh, do their best to get the, the function of the city working again, so they could get the worship of the city going again. Verse 70, and some of the chief of the fathers gave unto the work. The Tirshatha gave to the treasury a thousand drams of gold, 50 basins, 530 priest's garments. Some of the chief of the fathers gave to the treasury of the work 20,000 drams of gold, 2,200 pounds of silver, and that which the rest of the people, so notice everybody's participating, the rest of the people gave was 20,000 drams of gold, 2,000 pounds of silver, three score and seven priest's garments. So the priests and the Levites and the porters and the singers and some of the people and the Nethamims and all of Israel dwelt in their cities. And when the seventh month came, the children of Israel were in their cities. Now, just as a, a brief waypoint here, there are some people that struggle with the the record that's given to us here. Why did Nehemiah write down that, you know, these groups of people were giving these specific amounts? Giving, you know, to some degree, it should be, you know, anonymous, right? It's actually part of the reason why we don't pass the bags here as a church. We don't want you to give because the person next to you is giving, you know. Uh, Scripture tells us not to give of necessity or begrudgingly. You know, God loves a cheerful giver. No grumpy givers at Calvary, right? Well, a lot of times, if the bag's going around, you're gonna, it's called compulsory giving. You know, well, that person's doing it. That means I need to do it too. You know, uh, at church, you shouldn't find a wall where, you know, the names of the people who give the most every year are recorded. You know, you do see that in some churches. It's, it's heartbreaking. I mean, I don't mind it if I go to a zoo. At the Phoenix Zoo, yeah, as you're walking up to the, you know, doors of the zoo, there's all kinds of bricks in the road, and those are the people that gave certain amounts of money to help with the animal enclosures. That's great, you know. Uh, maybe we could do that for some of the Sunday school classrooms. That's a little more animal enclosure. But, um, you know, realistically, our giving to the Lord should be, you know, private. And so some people do struggle with, well, why does Nehemiah record it then? Yes, church, there are specific amounts given that are recorded here, but the actual names of the people that gave those amounts aren't recorded, just the positions that they held. Now, 
You could, if you wanted to, take the list, you know, read through the whole chapter there, chapter 7, look at the positions that were held, look at the names, and you could try to piece together some kind of list of who might have given what. Uh, first of all, you'd be absolutely wasting your time because it really doesn't matter. Uh, and, and second of all, it actually, if you did spend your time, from what I've read, you won't find it within the text. But I do love that, that there was an offering made to support the work of the temple. And I love that Nehemiah records it. You see, the offering was made so they could be effective in you know, promoting positions of fellowship and leadership within the temple. But those are also social positions in their community as well. You know, these people were, were being put together to make sure that the community was strong spiritually, emotionally, physically. And I think that that is important. Again, I'll share that verse I, I shared with you this morning as we read and prayed over our offering. Exodus 35, 20 and 21, where it says, All the congregation of the children of Israel departed from the presence of Moses, and they came, every one whose heart stirred him, and every one who his spirit made him willing. Sometimes we fight against the spirit of God. God's spirit is saying, you know, get involved, serve, you know, give of your time, your energy, your, your finances. But we'll fight against that. But this is clear. Those that, you know, were made willing, those whose hearts were stirred, it says they brought the Lord's offering to the work of the tabernacle of the congregation and for all of his service and for the holy garments. You see, it takes many to do the work of the Lord. You know, for years worldwide, uh, the stats hovered around 10% uh, of the people giving and serving so 100% of the people could be blessed. You know, of late, you know, some of the um, Barna reports and Pew polls that I've seen, it, it's uh, the last 8, 10 years or so, it's actually like 6 or 7%. Six or, now, it, we're way above that here at Calvary, and I want to thank you guys for that. More people giving and serving than at the typical church. But you know what? It's still a fraction of the amount of people that come through the doors. And yet, what we see is that we are all called to be a part of that work. And man, when everybody comes together in the work, the work of God is glorious. Chapter 8, verse 1. It says that all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate. And they spoke unto Ezra. And so this is the first time we're hearing about him now being back in the land. Of course, he had been there the whole time. They spoke unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. So at the end of chapter 7, right, we saw that it was the beginning of the seventh month. That's the month Tisri on the Jewish calendar. Now, the first day of the seventh month is the Feast of Trumpets. So uh, no doubt uh, that's a significant day for the people to come together. Scholars and historians agree. You know, the people are recognizing that, uh, and they're coming out into the streets to celebrate. They desire to worship God. They desire to set time aside in their busy lives to honor him, to, to give him glory. And I, and I love that it's a picture of celebration. And in that celebration, what do they do? Well, they call for Ezra. Fifteen years before Nehemiah showed up to rebuild the walls, Ezra showed up to rebuild the temple. The temple of the, of the house of God was, you know, pieced back together, and then God brought in another man who had a different calling to complete the, the work for the city. But Ezra, he comes out and he brings with him the book of law. What is that? It's the first five books of the Bible, right? The Torah. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. This is basically a, a roadmap for Israel. It's their instruction manual on how to walk with God. Now, they had, you know, uh, books of prophecy, and they had the poetic books, and you know, but the fact is, uh, this was the, the, the Torah. These scrolls were of the utmost importance to them. For the modern church, listen, we have 66 books. Genesis to Revelation, there's 66 books, 40 different authors, and every single one of them as important as the last. Every single one of them uh, necessary for our understanding of how to navigate this crazy world. But man, when they brought out that book of the law, you've got to remember, they hadn't been in God's word. These people, privately or corporately, for a long time. 
Now, they had a general idea of what God's heart was for them. I mean, even gathering in the streets on, on the Feast of Trumpets was an you know, example of that. It, it shows that you know, their hearts are in the right place. But church, what really stands out to me, what is so encouraging, is it's clear they wanted more. They wanted more than just the stories that had been handed down generationally. Now, why didn't they have the Word of God? Raise your hand if you have more than one Bible at home. <laughs> yeah, everybody. If you don't have a Bible, don't leave today without one. We've got beautiful Bibles. I'll put it in your hand. I'll talk to you about how to make your way through it. We have the Word of God available to us. These folks, when they were carried away into captivity, listen, the, you know, Nebuchadnezzar's army wasn't like, all right, you guys, now go grab your scripture books and, you know, pack a bag. You know, you're going to be gone for a while. No, they were murdering their parents, destroying their city. They didn't leave with all their belongings. They would have been blessed to leave with clothes on their backs. So they didn't have the the book of law. And so being raised in a, in a foreign culture, a secular culture, a wicked, demonic culture, they would have had to rely on the, you know, the word of God that had been imprinted on the hearts of the older ones. You know, men like Daniel and Mishael and Hananiah and Azariah, they would have had to rely on the expounding of God's word from, from memory alone. But church... They wanted it now, didn't they? They wanted to be washed in it. They wanted to be covered by it. Honestly, it's something that we stress here as a church all the time. The importance that you would have a, an intimate relationship with God through a, a private time of Bible study, a private time of prayer, supplication before the Lord. Please don't rely on a Sunday morning service as, you know, your entire spiritual nourishment for the week. No, oh, you need so much more. Daily, the Word of God. You know, I, I read the Bible on a daily basis, best that I can. I'm not going to stand here and tell you I'm perfect, you know, every day, you know. But a majority, 98%, whatever it is. I also listen to the Bible. I love to read the Bible. I also love to listen to it. You know, there's a, a free app you can download. Uh, it's from the Faith Comes by Hearing. It's just Bible IS. Bible is. And it has the dramatized Bible on it. Every book. You know, different characters. You know, Jesus on the Sea of Galilee storm raging. You hear the wind blowing and the waves crashing. I love that. You know, man, I, I listen to it constantly. I think it's important. I listen to our, our, our radio station as a church. We're so blessed, man. We're broadcasting the word of God over, over almost 900 square miles. You're sharing together in the blessings of that as we work to do the work. But man... Again, I want to stress how important it is that you, on your own, are a student of Scripture. You know, in John chapter 8, verse 32, Jesus says, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free, right? Who's he talking to? See, because to really pick up what he's putting down in verse 32, you have to read verse 31. In verse 31, it says, Jesus said to those Jews that believed on him. So he's talking to, to people that already heard about him, that already believed in him. He says, if you continue in my word, underline that in your Bible. You know what? Make a friend. If you're sitting next to somebody you don't know, reach, underline that in their Bible. Um, it's a great way to get to know somebody. He says, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. I need you to notice he doesn't say, hey, man, just listen to it that one time. Just listen to me talk one time, and you're going to be good to go. Just read through that scroll one quick time. You, you'll know everything you need to know. No, he says, you need to continue in my word. And then, if you do that, you will be my disciple. You see, if they really wanted to know him, they would have to get to know him through the power of his word. The Bible, church, the word of God. You know how many people have died for the word of God? You know what yesterday was the anniversary of? 609 years since John Huss was martyred for sharing the word of God. 609 years. That was 100 years, 104 years, 
before um, Martin Luther went and took his 95-point theses and nailed it to that uh, door of that Catholic church in Germany. Over 100 years earlier, you know, there was a, a guy named John Wycliffe. You guys know Wycliffe? Right? Probably not personally. Some of you look kind of old, but not, not that old. So 100 years before uh, Martin Luther, before the Reformation, there was a guy named John Wycliffe who took the, the Bible in the Catholic Church, only available to Catholics in Latin, only the priesthood could read it, and they, they would tell you what they wanted you to hear. No, Wycliffe took it secretly and translated the whole book into English. Well, one of his students was a man named John Huss. John Huss, he started reading the Bible. And you know what it did? It changed his life. It took a man who was living in darkness and it allowed him to see the world in the light for the first time. And you know what he did when he started reading the Bible? He went out and he told people about it. Imagine that. In an era when it was illegal to read the Bible. It was kept in Latin so only the Catholic Church knew what it said. And they had killed people over and over again for trying to do what Wycliffe did. Eventually, the Gutenberg Press would come into play, and they would put that thing on there and just start cranking out the Bible, and it went out, and it changed society as we know it. But it was because just a few men decided it was worthwhile to lay down their lives to give the world the Word of God. Be a John Huss, you know? Be willing to read that book and then go out and share it with others. Listen, no one's going to burn you at the stake. They literally, they took Huss into a Catholic church. They pronounced his death. They gave him one last shot. They took him outside, tied him to a pole, and they, they stacked wood and hay up to his neck. And they gave him one last chance. Recant what you've done. Never speak of this book again, and we'll let you live. You know what he said? Light the fire. I'd love to ask for a show of hands. Who's ready to say that today? I wonder how long it will be before someone tells you that's your choice. He said, I'd rather read and share the word of God than live another day. Imagine that. You know, get out your phones and put, you know, July 7th, just July 6th on your calendar. July 6th, 14, 15, John Huss gave his life for the word of God. We need more men like that. We need more women like that. People who are willing to say, you know, like the you know, apostles did when they were told, hey, we don't want you speaking in this name anymore. You know what? It's better to obey God than man. Amen. It's better to obey God than man. Why do we need the Bible? Because without it, we have nothing. And because with it, man, we have everything. Listen, we recently studied through the pastoral epistles. Two of the three. First and second Timothy. And in 2 Timothy 3.16, it says this. It says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It, literally, the, the construct of that statement means it's the breath of God. We need to treat it like that. We, we should have reverence for God's word. This is the breath of God. And it says it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness, that the man of God might be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So what is the word of God good for, church? Absolutely everything. It's good for doctrine. The, the word means teaching or instruction. Actually, in the Old Testament, uh, you find it as the word precepts. Now, I want to read two of those to you, two verses that use it that way to help you understand how we might better apply it to our lives. God's word. Psalm 119, 27. It says, Make me to understand the way of thy precepts, and so shall I talk of thy wondrous works. Boy, no doubt Huss read that, you know? And you start to understand the teaching and instruction of the Word of God, and you have no choice but to go out and to share it with others, to go out and proclaim the good news, to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, an ambassador for the kingdom of heaven. Psalm 119, 104, it says, Through thy precepts, through thy, thy teaching and instruction, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. You know what? When we learn the truth, we begin to abhor the lie. We don't hate the, the sinner, but we hate the sin. We have to learn to hate the sin. 
There's too much acceptance of sin in the world today. There's too much acceptance of sin in the church today. You know, the church has become a haven for sin instead of for the saint. It's not the way that the word of God proclaims the people of God should be or act. No, we, we learn to hate sin, and in doing so, we learn to love the sinner. Uh, raise your hand if you walked in here without any sin today. I just want to check. Um, yeah, we're not, we're not supposed to condemn people for sinning. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You're not the judge or jury of anybody, okay? So if you're lording yourself over somebody, if you're living a self-righteous life and condemning people for the way that they're living, please don't forget by which you came to the Lord. You were called out of darkness and into the light. Be a demonstration of that light to others. Live your life in such a way that you might be able to be an example to those that you sinned with of what it looks like, man, to live a changed life, a better life. Scripture is good for reproof. It simply means evidence. You know, the word of God is evidence of God. It's good for correction, it says. It means restoration to an upright state. You know, Psalm 119.11, it says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. It's the same concept, you know. It's really what the children of Israel had to do when they went out into the world, man. God's word was hidden in their hearts. They didn't have it. They, they weren't allowed to take it with them. But, man, it, it brought instruction. And actually, that word... When it says that it's good for instruction, it means chastisement or chastening. People love to hear that it's good for doctrine, that it's good for reproof, and even correction, because that means restoration. But, man, instruction, we start to go, oh, that's where I draw the line. Nobody chastens me. Listen, I I'm blessed that people in my life were willing to come and say, hey, man, the life you're living, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take you straight to hell. Is that where you want to end up? You have to be willing to, to chasten. Jesus said, Revelation 3.19, to the church of Laodicea, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. You know, if you love someone enough, you're going to tell them, listen, that life you're living, that's not the life God called you to live. That life of sin, listen, sin leads to death. The wage of sin is death, right? The word of God tells us that. Payment for sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. No, you should, in love, be willing to tell somebody that that sin they're living in is going to not just ruin this life, but their eternity. And, and you know what? I think the people there in Jerusalem knew all of that. Don't forget, Jeremiah was telling them that. This life you're living, oh, man, it's going to get you carried away into foreign lands. You're going to go through years of bondage. And they didn't listen. They persecuted him. They imprisoned him. And then what happened? Well, Nebuchadnezzar showed up at the door, destroyed their city, carried away their children. They knew God loved them, and through love came chastening. And I, I believe they wanted that again. They needed that in their lives. Look what it says in verse 2. Ezra, the priest, brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women. I need you to notice what it says next. And all that could hear him with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. So it's the Feast of Trumpets. They're out in the streets. And this tells us who needed to hear the word. Men and women and everybody who could understand it needed to hear it. Listen, I'll be the first to tell you, there's a reason we have a Sunday school here at Calvary. There's a reason we have children's church here at Calvary. Kids should learn at a kid pace. You know, uh, kids should learn with proven curriculum. We have an incredible answers in Genesis curriculum. They should learn with proven techniques so that they can understand God through his word they can understand what his word says about him, what his word says about them in relation to him. Truth be told, I often see kids here in the sanctuary looking at me with these bewildered looks on their eyes, like, what in the world is this guy saying? I see parents sometimes going, well, I didn't know he was going to say that. You know, listen, I cannot let a child in the room keep me from talking about things that are important. You know, whether it's homosexuality or abortion or, you know, whatever happens to be, you know, within the text. I refuse to let, you know, anything keep me from sharing the word of God. Because especially we have a beautiful place for children to be where they can be taught with understanding. Sometimes, you know, 
parents, you know, kids get distracted because they don't understand what I'm talking about, and so they start goofing off, and so parents start trying to, you know, handle them and deal with them, and they start missing out on what the Word of God is saying. You don't think that the devil likes that? Listen, kids would benefit from a children's church program, but you know what? They would also benefit from deeper times of Bible study with you, their parents and grandparents. Parents and grandparents should be, man, pouring the word of God over their kids, speaking it constantly. As a matter of fact, it says in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 6, and I believe that this is why the children of Israel, when they were led away into captivity several different times, still had the word of God with them. Because God commanded them, Deuteronomy 6, 5, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all of thy heart, with all of thy soul, with all of thy might, and these words which I command you this day shall be in your heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto your children. And you shall talk of them when you sit in your house. And when you walk by the way. And when you lie down. And when you rise up. Listen, this is how God preserved his word amongst the masses for generations. It's got to be said I'm not against kids being in, you know, our Sunday morning services. As long as they can sit without being distracting, as long as they can listen and understand. If they can get something out of it, great. But if they can't, they should go into the Sunday school where we know they're going to. But with all of that being said, I also think at times we can sell our kids short. Oh, he's not ready to hear that. She's not ready to hear that. You know, people will come to me. They have 13 and 14-year-olds. You know, what are you going to tell? You're going to share days of lot alert today. I'm afraid you're going to say something they might hear. They're hearing it in the world. They should be able to hear the truth of it in the house of God. And I think kids are capable of sitting through a 60-minute Bible study, by the way. I mean, they'll play video games for four hours and master it, you know. They shouldn't be doing that. But, you know, they'll go watch a three-hour movie. They can't listen to an hour-long Bible study? Of course they can. You know, 1 Timothy 4.12, it says, Let no man despise your youth, but be an example of the believer in word and conversation and charity and spirit and faith and purity. You know, to be fair, Paul's writing to Timothy, Timothy's early 30s when he writes that. So we're not talking about youth like 12-year-olds, 15-year-olds, but it's applicable. We can't sell our kids short, but we also have to, in wisdom, help them navigate how they learn about God. Let's just read the next few verses quickly, and then we'll actually pick back up here next week. Nehemiah 8.3. It says, and he, meaning Ezra, read therein before the street that was before the water gate, everybody underline this, from morning until midday. So <coughs> 9 a.m. to 3. So next time, y'all tell me I went over. <laughs> Let's just remember how long Ezra goes, <laughs> and then we'll, you know, keep it in perspective. So from morning until midday, before the men and the women and those that could understand, and the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood upon a pulpit of wood, which they had made for the purpose, and beside him stood uh, Matthiah and Shema and Anani and Urijah and Hilkiah and Messiah. And on his right hand, oh, those were on his right, on his left, Padiah and Mishael and Malchiah and Hashum and Hashbadan, Zechariah and Meshalem, and Ezra opened the book in the sight of the people, for he was above all the people. And I love this. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. And all the people answered, Amen. Amen. With lifting up of their hands. And they bowed their heads and they worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Again, I'm only going to touch briefly on this. We'll pick back up here next week and dig deeper into it. But I couldn't help it. Take a, just a couple of short minutes and talk about the reverence for the Word of God that's on display here. I mean, there is a beautiful picture of honor portrayed before the Lord. Try to paint that picture in your head. I mean, thousands of people in the streets, right? We read there's about 42,000 people in Jerusalem. How many of them are out in the streets? I don't know. But there are thousands of people setting aside everything that day, congregating, taking their focus off of the world and taking their focus off of themselves and setting their eyes, church, setting their hearts on the Lord and on his word. You know what? 
If we could get people to do this today, you know what we would see? One word. What am I looking for? Revival. If we could get people to do this today, we'd see revival through the land. We would see pride turn to repentance. We would see church humility lead to restoration. And you know what we would see? We would see God's hand of mercy stretched out over our community, our country, over this world. Listen, that's not just what I want to see. That's what God wants to see. You need to hear this. The church is not waiting on revival. Revival is waiting on the church. Revival is ready. Revival is like that, that rock that you throw out into that, that still water on the pond. You know, you throw it out there, and it makes a nice little splash, and then it ripples out in every direction. Revival is waiting on the church. We just have to rise up. We have to get excited about what God is doing in our lives. We have to get excited about what his word says in regard to the day that we're living in, in regard to the second coming. He's going to call his church home soon. Seven years of great tribulation will be, you know, judgment on planet earth. And then there will be a second coming. In excitement, we need to tell this world there's a little time left to make a choice, to follow after God, to lay down our, our lives individually and, and live our lives for him. I'm, I'm going to leave you with that thought out of 2 Chronicles 7.14, where it says, if my people, which are called by my name, is that you? Ask yourself that question right now. Is that me? Are you his? Are you called by his name? Then do what follows. Humble yourself and pray. Seek his face. Turn from your wicked ways. He'll hear you from heaven. He'll forgive your sin. He will heal your land. That's a promise. Listen, the Bible, there's almost 8,000 promises in the word of God. It's one of them. If you do this, he'll do that. If you're his kid, if you believe in him, if you're called by his name, humble yourself, pray. Be a person of prayer, a family of prayer. Seek his face. You know, it goes back to what Jesus said, if my, to those that believe on him, continue in my word. To seek his face is not just to look once. It's to look continually. To seek the Lord God Almighty. And when you seek him, he will be found of you. Turn from your ways. He'll hear you from heaven. He'll forgive your sin. Church, he'll heal our land. I don't know about you, but I've been crying out to God for years, heal this land, this crazy world that we live in. You know what? I believe God is preparing this world. He's preparing his church for revival. I believe that. I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing if I didn't believe that. I don't think you would be here today if you didn't believe it. The question is, what are we going to do about it? Because you know what revival takes? Just one person. One person. Let's go back to July 6, 1415. John Huss said, you know what? If it takes my life to wake people up to the word of God, light a fire. Are you ready to say that to your friends, your family? This is the word of God. Let me tell you what it says. Let me speak of, of God's wondrous works. You'd be amazed what people are willing to sit down and talk to you about if you would just ask the question. I'm going to pray that the Lord would give each of us a heart to do that today, to be bold, to ask, to seek and to knock. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we are so grateful for you. We're so grateful for the, the power of your word, for your call on your church, for your love, for your mercy and grace. Lord, today I'm grateful that I'm able to share such a beautiful day with such beautiful people. That, Lord, we together could be washed in your word, challenged and encouraged to, to rise above the fray, to live our lives boldly and out loud for your name's sake. We know, Lord God, your word declares that it is 
your desire that none would perish, that all would come to repentance, but to understand a need for repentance, they must hear your word. And how can they hear your word without those that are sent to share it? In this room are hundreds of people called to be ambassadors for your kingdom, called to bring your word into the highways and byways, into their homes and schools and workplaces. Lord, I pray that you would imprint your word on each of our hearts. Lord, that we would be encouraged by the story of us. We're not facing death for sharing your word with others. In most, even worst cases, it's just an awkwardness amongst family members. And so, Lord, let us rise above the, Lord, uh, feelings of the flesh that we might walk in the Spirit and testify of all of your wondrous works to see your kingdom come and your will be done. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name.